I'm Benedita from Voting Works, and this is Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today, we have episode 354 for December 11th, 2023, and we have got just an amazing interview for you today. This is this is a subject that is very near and dear to me personally, uh, something that I've been worried about for a long time, not just since 2020, when you know, we had a real issue here with people believing the results of the presidential election here in the United States. But I mean, this goes all the way back, at least for me, back to 2000, you know, when we were counting hanging chads in Florida with Bush v. Gore. Uh, we've had some trouble in this country around trusting the outcome of our elections. There are many people here in the U.S., especially in our modern era, unfortunately, that just simply don't trust our election systems and question the validity of their results. And yet, our election officials and our cybersecurity leaders are assuring us that our elections are secure and that voter fraud is effectively non-existent. Uh, while security researchers like those at DEF CON Voting Village have found several concerning vulnerabilities in voting equipment, we have actually zero evidence that anyone has maliciously changed the outcome of an election by hacking. So those things seem to be at odds with each other. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask our guest today about that. I mean, let's face it, if, if you're talking about democracy, there are just two crucial fundamental aspects to any democratic election. And one is getting accurate results. But the other that is, frankly, possibly more important is having the electorate trust that the results were accurate and valid. Because even if they were, if a lot of people don't believe they were accurate, unfortunately, perception can become reality. So today we are going to, we're going to dig deep into how elections work here in the U.S., how they may be vulnerable to attack or, or influence, and what we can do to ensure fair and accurate elections while simultaneously convincing the public that the results are valid. And I can think of no better person to talk to you about this than Ben Adida, the founder and executive director of Voting Works, who have been working on creating open source, easy to use voting equipment that follow all the standards that all of our cybersecurity experts tell us are required for a fair, accurate, auditable election. And there's a lot of very interesting nuances to this that are different than standard cybersecurity. So this was an absolutely amazing interview with some very, very crucial information. Um, and we're going to get to it right away. The only thing I will say real quick before we start is we throw out the term ADA. Uh, in the United States, that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, this was the legislation that was passed in 1990, signed by George H.W. Bush, that basically assured that folks with disabilities have equal access to the things they need to have access to. And that includes, obviously, elections in a democracy. So anyway, that is a term we throw out briefly, and I just want to make sure you knew what we were referring to. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's get to the interview with Ben Adida. Ben is the executive director and founder of Voting Works, a nonpartisan nonprofit maker of U.S. voting equipment. And Ben received his Ph.D. from MIT's Cryptography and Information Security Group, where he focused on election security. Welcome to the show, Ben. It's great to be here, Kerry. So what is the mission of Voting Works? What drove you to found it? And maybe, you know, what are some of your big accomplishments to date? Yeah. So what led to the founding of Voting Works is this feeling that while there was plenty of good research on making voting equipment better in the U.S., it wasn't really translating into practice. Mm. And so I decided to start Voting Works to make voting equipment that everyone can trust and to just hopefully have uh, better voting systems. Our mission is to make election technology everyone can trust. We started at the very end of 2018, and yeah, we were almost five years old now. Well, we argue about a lot of things in this country politically, but it, at the end of the day, how we vote and how we trust the uh, the outcome of those votes is like the most fundamental things in democracy, almost by definition, right? It's important work, and I'm really excited to talk to you about some of these things today, because it's gotten to be a real problem in our country, uh, as I'm sure you are well aware. Yes, I agree. I always try to start with the basics. So I want to make sure the audience understands fundamentally how elections work. And we might think we know, but we what we usually see is what happens when we go to the voting booth. That's kind of our exposure to it as voters is we go and we we vote and we leave. Hopefully we vote. Yes. Um, so 
but you know, but there's a lot more to it than, than what we see from just that limited experience, right? So if I were a poll worker or if I was an election official, there's probably a lot more that I get to see that a regular voter wouldn't. So tell us a little bit, you know, for, all the way from like registration, because that's important too, if you're purging voter rolls and things like that. Registration to voting, to tabulation, reporting, all these things. Talk to us about the basic process. And, and then as we kind of go, because we're going to be talking about security, kind of help us like what sort of equipment do we encounter along the way? Because we're gonna then we're gonna talk about vulnerabilities. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few high level bits. Uh, if I describe the whole process, this would be a very long podcast. <laughs> sure. uh, but at a high level, it's important to remember that states decide how they run their elections. Right. right. The federal government in the U.S. provides guidelines and provides standards that are called voluntary systems mm -hmm. guidelines, vo voting systems guidelines. But ultimately, the states decide. And usually, in most states, the state makes some decisions, and then the counties or the towns make more decisions about right. how they run their elections. Some states are very local. Some states are more top-down at the state level, central decision-making in terms of voting equipment and whatnot, and in terms of the process. But the states figure out how they do voter registration, right? You're registered to vote in a given state. There's, in fact, been controversy recently about one of the efforts that I think is a very important effort where states coordinate their voter lists so that when you move from one state to the other, mm. the right thing happens. Because that doesn't automatically happen, right? right? So you're right to point out that the first thing in a voting system is who's allowed to vote. So the states manage voter registration lists. Those registration lists then have to be fed into the process of deciding which ballot you get because mm – -hmm. We don't hold one election in the U.S. We hold many elections that are squished together into one event. Right. The federal election, state election, county election, local election, school district elections, all of those tend to be squished into one event, into one ballot. And so there's an entire process for figuring out well, where you live, which means which water district you're in, which school district you're in, which congressional district you're in, mm -hmm. and based on that, preparing a ballot that – is for you, which is called a ballot style. A ballot style is a composition of questions that's meant for a subset of voters that live in that okay. intersection of all those districts, right? Mm -hmm. So you, so the prep, you know, voter registration, assignment of ballot styles to voters based on where they live, potentially mailing out ballots if you're doing vote by mail ahead of time. Some states you have to ask for a ballot. Some states you're automatically sent a ballot. On the West Coast, there's more vote by mail. On the East Coast, there's mm. less. And the main thing to understand is that there's a pretty big difference between the United States and the way many other democracies run election. And the reason for that is this combination of elections that I talked about, the federal, the state, the local, and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And the fact that you and your next door neighbor might actually vote on a different ballot style. And then the fact that sometimes people don't vote on an English ballot, right? They vote on a mm -hmm. Spanish ballot or mm -hmm. they vote on a ballot in – any number of different languages, depending on how many people in that county, in that state, speak that language. Okay. So, for example, L.A. County produces ballots in 12 different languages. Oh, wow. So when you look at the combinatorics of the different ballot mm -hmm. styles, the different language, et cetera, you get a lot of different combinations. And ultimately, it's that complexity, the length of our ballots, the different types of ballots, the different languages of ballots that lead to using technology. Hmm. If we were just voting on one contest or two contests, the way that many European democracies do, and it was in one language and everybody had the same ballot, you could probably just have paper that you marked mm -hmm. by hand mm -hmm. and that you counted by hand. With this important exception of how do you make this accessible to voters with disabilities, sure. yeah. which we, we should talk about at one point. But if you put that aside for a second, you could imagine that hand marking a paper ballot, hand counting that, if you've got one or two questions, easy, right? But if you've got 40 contests and those 40 contests are not the same between you and your next door neighbor, and there might be different languages, that's when you start to need equipment technology to actually count those ballots. So yeah, then you have to, that equipment needs to be built, needs to be certified. Is it secure? Is it operated properly? You have to train people on it. You have to operate it on the day of. And in most of the U.S., you know, upwards of 90% of American voters today was in fact 95% in 2020 vote on a paper ballot. Mm. 
Okay. Either marked by hand most of the time, or sometimes marked by a machine that where you use a touch screen and then it prints out a ballot. And so then you have to count those that paper. You have to archive that paper. You have to make it available for audits and recounts potentially afterwards. You have to store it securely for 22 months. So there's a there's a lot of complexity to an election. But of course, this, the biggest complexity happens when a voter is trying to vote because the most important thing in an election is you want to make sure that when that voter is going to cast a ballot, nothing stands in their way, right? Mm. Because even a few obstacles, a few things going wrong, the machine's not working for half an hour, there's a power outage or whatever it is, that could disenfranchise a bunch of voters. Most people don't have three or four hours to wait around to vote, right? right. They need to get to work and, and all of that. So a lot of this work, a lot of this preparation, a lot of this training goes into trying to ensure that voters can vote by waiting in line for not too long and then by casting a ballot relatively quickly. And I'll add another piece of technology that's in there that actually helps that a lot, which is getting more attention these days, that is electronic poll books. So when you mm. come in and you're checked off the list, like Benedita, yes, you're on the list, we check you off. If you're going to a busy polling location, of which there are more of as we go, because in a number of states, we now have vote centers where you can go and vote anywhere in your county, not just at your, the place that, you're, that you were assigned to vote at. So a lot of people could show up. And they need to be checked in. And sometimes you, know, you can imagine having a paper list that you split like A through D is over there and E <laughs> right. through M is over there. And you do all Which that. Which I've seen many times when I vote, yeah. You've seen many times. But that can still slow you down, right? right? So having a digital way to sign you in could be really helpful in parallelizing check-in, especially because there are peak times at voting, right? Like 8.45 a.m., Lots of people are going to be voting, right? 5.15 p.m., lots of people are going to be voting. How do you handle the onslaught of people at that time? And then in a place where you have vote centers, where you could go anywhere you want, how do you ensure that somebody doesn't vote twice, right? You right. have to check them in one location. That information has to be synchronized to the other locations so they can't go 30 minutes later and vote somewhere else. Right. So electronic poll books are another big part of the process these days, and it's becoming a more important part as you get this voter choice model where voters get to go vote wherever they want. Well, and there's one more step in this that I'm curious about, and that is after we fill out the paper ballot or it's been printed for us and we put it in the scanning machine and we walk out the door, there is tabulation that goes on at each, at each individual polling site. But then there's also you know, correlation and tabulation done across all those sites. And there's some mechanism by which these results started getting reported, like when the news says, yes. and the polls have closed at seven o'clock and now we can tell you blah. You know, so what, what is that next step that we don't see where all these things start to come together and for a given state, they start collating and releasing to the public or press yeah. these things? Well, one thing that's really important to know is that some of these early results you get, they're not reported necessarily by the states and counties. Sometimes they are. Sometimes that data is, I mean, the counties are doing the best job they can of getting that data out. But sometimes, oftentimes they have to drive... USB sticks from the polling locations to the mm. central location, then add them up there and then release results. So when you're getting data minutes after the polls close, sometimes that's oftentimes, in fact, it's reporters on location at the precincts reporting data that they see posted on the wall, right, from that precinct. And so you're getting data that's actually being reported outside the official channels by reporters on the ground. But you're absolutely right that election night result reporting is a whole nother piece of this puzzle, right? How do you aggregate that data? How do you set the right expectation when you have more vote by mail? And sometimes the vote by mail patterns are not the same as the in-person voting patterns. And so you get a whole chunk of vote by mail ballots that are reported and it changes the current leader in the mm -hmm. in in the election. And that's confusing. So yes, the, the process of reporting results is also an important run. You're right, you're right to call it out. All right. So now that we kind of have walked through the process, uh, help, help me understand where the vulnerabilities lie in our system in the U.S. Sure. It, it, all, you know, and I realize that we've got a lot of different systems, but generally speaking, you throw out the processes you just described. Uh, but you also touched on a couple of things I want to make sure we also cover here. And that is when we talk about security, there's the, you know, 
the geeks of us know there's the CIA triad, right? There's confidentiality, integrity, and, and availability. And we focus a lot in elections on integrity, you know, like somehow someone messed with the vote. But the but confidentiality is important. We have a private vote in the U.S., so which is why you can't take a – well, I don't think you're supposed to be able to take a copy of your paper ballot out of the polling place to prove how you voted, either Correct. for coercion or for privacy's sake. But there's also availability, which you touched on, which is if I can't change the outcome of the election, but if I can make it really hard to vote or – take down machines so that people can't vote or uh, vote on the wrong day, you know, that, that those are other things too. So yeah, I'm sure we could talk a whole hour just on this as well, but from a high level, what are the vulnerabilities in the systems based on the processes we just discussed? Well, I think what you laid out is actually a great way to think about it. Uh, there is a category of issues that have to do with availability and threats on denial of service, which can look technical or can look procedural or can look very human, right? And, oh, Democrats vote on Wednesday and Republicans vote on Tuesday. You know, these jokes that <laughs> right. uh, actually have some historical yes, uh, backgrounds to them. Uh, so so that's a whole category of stuff. And it's different from the rest, like as, as it always is in security, denial of service is its own category of stuff, right? And we should be, we should be thinking about that. How does, how do we make sure that voters get a chance to vote when they vote, their line the line's not out the door for 45 minutes or an hour. The equipment's working. You know, if it's not working, there's still a way to make sure their vote is cast. You know, all, all of that stuff, and and the, that's a, that's its own category. The other part, and I think everybody understands that pretty well because it maps to other aspects of security systems quite well. But the first part you mentioned doesn't actually map that well to typical security systems, and that is ballot secrecy. And you might say, well, we are confidentiality. Yeah, we, we know about confidentiality. But the level of secrecy that we expect in an election is a lot stronger than anything else. When you think about confidentiality in any other system, think of a bank, think of your doctor, right? You're talking about you have access to your financial data and your bank has access to your financial data. And we just want nobody else to have access right. to that data, right? Kind of the same thing when you're dealing with medical data. You should have access to that data. Your doctor should have access to that data. And nobody else should have access to that data. But here we're talking about a system where you should have confidence in how you voted, but the state shouldn't know how you voted. Right. And in addition to that, if you were inclined to tell somebody how you voted, of course you can tell them how you voted, but you shouldn't be able to do so convincingly. You shouldn't be able to bring back proof of how you right. voted. Because if you could bring back proof of how you voted, then you, your vote could be bought or you could be threatened to vote a certain way. Right. And of course, this principle isn't perfect. There are some ways in which you can mostly prove how you voted. If you are voting by mail and your spouse is there and you show them how you voted, you put it in the envelope and you mail it, chances are you gave them evidence of how you voted. And, right. and sometimes people worry about that. I sometimes worry about, about that a little bit. The main thing we want to prevent is voting coercion at scale, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that really, really shouldn't be able to happen. And uh, and remember, coercion, sometimes people are willing to be coerced, right? Like maybe people yeah. don't care enough about their election. They'll take a hundred bucks to be <laughs> right, to be right. coerced, right? So that when you think about that model and you think about the difficulty of enforcing that level of ballot secrecy and still having integrity, that is the central complexity of voting. And it is ultimately the reason why every election security expert says, the only way we know how to do this is with paper ballots. Because the paper ballot has two really important properties. One, it is almost universal medium for conveying to a voter how their vote was recorded. I said almost because I'm still punting on the accessibility issue, which oh, is sure, a yeah. really big deal. And we should, you know, I, I hope we can spend a couple minutes on it. But for most voters, paper, a paper ballot is going to directly re explain to them or show them how they voted, whether they marked it by hand or whether they it was printed by a computer, right? It's on paper. There's no mediation. I can look at it. I can say, yeah, this vote for Alice was recorded properly. So that's property number one of a paper ballot. The second property of a paper ballot is you can maintain a chain of custody of paper ballots that is understandable by people who are not cryptography and IT experts, right? right. Like it's a physical chain of custody that allows for recounts and audits and all of that, right? And so the paper plays this dual role of being the thing that every voter most voters can read and see, and that can be maintained through standard physical chain of custody, 
and later audited and, and, and recounted and whatnot. That is the only way that we know at scale today to have an election where you can be confident of how you voted because you saw it directly and through a process that is audited and logged and has all these you know checks and balances on it, we can be confident that we kept a good chain of custody on all the ballots and thus we can audit and count and, and recount and that kind of thing. All right. So let's not forget that point you, uh, that you brought up. So let's cover that now. What? Well, let's talk about accessibility and how that complicates the process of voting and how that kind of dictates in some cases how we have to, to set up our, vo- our, our voting places and our voting equipment. So let, let's talk about some of the situations that, that we, some people might not be thinking about. How does that play into this? Yeah, Th- this will be a slight oversimplification, but I think you can think of two categories of accessibility needs. One category is where the voter is not able to see the paper ballot. And another category is where the voter is not able to interact with a paper ballot with a pen or pencil, right? The ways in which you can't, you can't interact, the limitations in interaction, there are different levels, of course, right? Like maybe you mm-hmm. can use a marker or maybe you can use a touch screen, but, or maybe you can't. Maybe you need a sip and puff device to, to, to interact with the voting system. And we want to do this in a way that is compliant with the ADA, right? And compliant with the idea that voters with disabilities should have the right to cast a ballot. And the way that we talk about it in the election space is privately and independently, right? Because they're citizens, <laughs> of right. course, right, like right, everybody right. Yeah. else, right? So how do we do that? Well, the main way that we do that is with a technology called the ballot marking device, which is a computer that lets a voter prepare a paper ballot. And to prepare that ballot, you can use a touchscreen or you can use a sip and puff device or you can use another tactile controller. And of course, the system has to be able to read that paper ballot back out to you. Now, we should be clear here. If a voter does not have the ability to see a paper ballot directly, the best we can do is a mediated verification, right? There's a computer in the middle that's going to read that ballot to them. And there's always efforts to think about, well, maybe that mediation can be done by the voter's computer, meaning by their phone, right? So at mm. least it's their device that's mm-hmm. reading the ballot back out to them. Bring your so own we, device to the podium, yeah. Yeah, bring your own device, right, to, to read the ballot back out to you. So we think about those kinds of things, but that's not universal either, right? And that can be pretty stressful. And ultimately, I think we should acknowledge that one of the central dilemmas here, which is that if you talk to voters with dis- disabilities, they will tell you that they really would prefer to vote from home where mm-hmm. they have their own setup, their own computers that can read things back out to them. And on the security front, we, we just don't know how to do that at scale in a way that preserves election integrity. We should sit with that dilemma because it's real. Mm-hmm. You know, when The story I like to tell everybody is when we moved in the early 2000s to touchscreen voting machines in the U.S., a lot of states moved to touchscreen voting machines that didn't have paper ballots. That didn't Why? have hanging chads. <laughs> didn't have didn't have hanging chads. That's right. But it didn't have paper ballots. Why? So much easier to operate, right? It's just memory in the machine. You don't have to deal with paper. Paper is hard to handle, all of that stuff. There are obvious security issues when you think about it, right? Like how easy it is to change that those records. But let's not act like there weren't advantages too. The advantages in terms of logistics, in terms of accessibility, in terms of just like simplicity of using the system. In saving terms of, printing you know, costs. <laughs> yeah, you're saving a ton of money. I mean, you do have more machines, so there's a right. trade-off in terms of maybe more investment up front, right? But these are touchscreens machines with memory. They're not terribly complicated, right? The key thing is, if you talk to voters with this, especially blind voters, who went through this process, who voted before those machines came about, voted when those machines came about, and then voted after those machines were banned, which they are in most states at this point. For blind voters, they had a period of time where they got to vote privately and independently. Hmm. They didn't have it before 2000. They roughly didn't have it after 2012. But in the middle, they had that, and they lost it. Hmm. And, you know... This is a hard problem space. It's very difficult. We shouldn't oversimplify it. In the process of dialing up security, we took away some accessibility. And maybe that's the right trade-off, if it has to be a trade-off, but it should be an acknowledged trade-off. 
and it should be a conversation we continue to have and we continue to try to do better on. So you, you've touched on some of the potential solutions with some of these technical issues, but let's, I want to dig into a little bit more, like when people think about the vulnerabilities of our systems, a lot of people go straight to the computerized stuff. So mm -hmm. computers can be hacked. And so we've got these, uh, these direct reporting DREs, direct rec record, I forget, always forget. Direct recording by electronics. Yeah. Those are the touchscreen yeah. machines without paper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That we've thankfully started getting rid of, but people think, okay, those are hacked. Like I'm, I, that shows me that I voted for Biden, but it's really voting for Trump or right. I can't see it, which is where the paper ballots come in. But what are some of the other technical, like maybe the scanning machines or the tabulation machines? These are all computers. It's, it's hardware and software. So I assume that could be hacked like anything that is a computer today. So I take it those are some of the vulnerabilities. What, what are some of the solutions then? How do we harden these devices or how do we change the processes? Again, paper ballots is one solution to address some of these vulnerabilities. Yeah, it's a great question. So of course, anything that's computerized can be hacked. Uh, at the same time, I like to make sure that we remind ourselves that it's not a Boolean. It can be hacked or it cannot be hacked. There's great, there's degrees, mm. right? And we should have significant efforts to layer defenses there so that yes, given enough effort, you can hack all of the electronics in a voting system. This is true, but also you should make it hard. <laughs> also, it should be, you know, there should be obstacles along the way because ultimately in an election, because of the ballot secrecy that I mentioned earlier, which requires, uh, I forgot to mention this, it requires us discarding information. In any system, in a banking system, in a health system, you're logging out the wazoo, everything that, every interaction that happens, right? But you can't do that in a voting system. You have to discard information about who voted for what. That means you shouldn't record the order in which voters appeared at the polling location. You should be mm -hmm. careful about how the ballots get stacked. Like you are actively trying to remove forensic information from the system for the sake of ballot secrecy. And so you're left with a system that's just harder to audit, right? Because of ballot secrecy. So what does that mean? That's the reason why we have paper ballots, as you mentioned, right? Because if we didn't have paper ballots, it's really hard to know how we could conduct an audit that is meaningfully connected to what the voter, the decision right. the voter made. The paper creates that connection, but the paper is still going through a scanner. Right. And the reason it's going through a scanner, which is just another computer, right? The reason it's going through a scanner is because of all the tabulation complexity I mentioned at the beginning with different ballot styles, long ballots, et cetera. Right. And counting by hand, which some people have been advocating for in the last few years, is really a terrible idea in the United States. It's a terrible idea in the United States because these ballots are complex. It takes a very long time to count them by hand. And why are you going to trust that? These are people making decisions, right? They're going to yeah. be inconsistent. The, the one thing that technology that works well can do for us is be consistent and be objective in evaluating this is a filled bubble, this is not a filled bubble, right? As mm -hmm. opposed to a human who, you know, if it's before lunch or after lunch might make different decisions, right? Like we know how that goes. Mm -hmm. So counting ballots by hand is extremely expensive, not actually a fair thing to do in American elections because – different people counting will be making different decisions, right? And so just not something that I would ever recommend, uh, except if you're in a very small town with plenty of people who want to help, maybe it's okay. But at any reasonable size, it's no longer okay. So you've got to use computers. So what do you do? And that's the entire category of post-election audits. And the best kind of post-election audit is something called a risk-limiting audit. The whole concept of the post-election audit is you put a bunch of paper through a scanner. The scanner gave you a result. You're then going to go through a statistical sampling process of looking at a subset of those paper ballots and checking that they match what the scanner saw. And because that is external to the voting system, because that sampling is random, you're able to cap the probability, cap the chance that the scanner cheated and you didn't catch it right? You're, you're able to cap it in a strong way. And by the way, cheating is not even the thing I'm most worried about. Misconfigurations, mistakes, like honest bugs in a system are much more likely. They can happen if a scanner is getting a little older and maybe it's reading bubbles a little more clearly on one side of the ballot than on the other. That's nobody designed right. it that way. It wasn't, it wasn't malicious, you know, but that can happen. Right. And so these kinds of post-election audits, they will catch all of those issues, whether they're malicious or not. Right. Because they will simply be checking statistically 
did the scanner do a good enough job of reading those ballots? And that check is going to be done by people. So I said people are bad at counting ballots. That's true, except when they're counting just a few ballots. If they're counting just a few ballots, mm. it's okay, right? And so we use the computers for scale, and we use the humans for auditing, because if you're doing just a few ballots, you can literally put them on an overhead projector, have 100 people in the audience watching that auditing process and saying, yep, that is a vote for Donald Trump, or yes, that is a vote for Joe Biden, right? You can, you can do that. The great news about post-election audits, specifically risk-limiting audits, is they're now being run in a number of states. They started in Colorado in 2017. There are now 10 states, I think 11 states, sorry, that are running post-risk-limiting uh, audits. It's one of the things we're really proud of at VotingWorks. We've wrote the open source software called Arlo that 10 states are using to run these mm -hmm. post-election audits. And notably that the state of Georgia used in the 2020 election when the post-election audit escalated to a full mm -hmm. hand count because mm -hmm. the margin was so tight. Yeah. That was using our software, open source software, to, to, to run the logistics and the, the, the dance of doing the, the statistical formula, the sampling, and all of that stuff. And that's something that should be done, by the way, as a matter of course. The idea of a post-election audit is not something you do because a problem was detected. And everybody in the field acknowledges that calling it an audit it makes people think that it's a bad thing. It's like an IRS audit. That only happens if something's fishy, mm. right? <laughs> sure, um, right. But actually, no. The, the idea here is that you should run the audit as a matter of course, and the audit will flag any issues. You know, it's, it's, it's proper hygiene, right? Like you run an election, you run a post-election audit, and if everything checks out, then you certify the result. Right. That's been happening more and more in U.S. elections in the last four years, and that's a really good thing. Yeah, so it's kind of like an it's more like an inspection, right? Or it's it and we do this with you know things entering our ports. We do this with things crossing the border. We do it with uh, you know random inspections when people are coming back through customs and things like that, right? We don't do, inspect everybody. We inspect a few people kind of randomly to keep people honest. And I think the really cool thing about risk leading on it's I don't want to get too hyper technical, but there's a lot of math and statistics behind it, right? How close was the election? How many people voted in that election? What I don't know if like external polls filter into that, but there's basically it looks at the election results and figures out, okay, based on how close it was, how many people voted, how many of these do we need to pick at random for us to statistically, mathematically say that, okay, if these kind of generally line up with what the overall results are, we're probably good. If not, then we need to dig deeper. Did I, did I paraphrase that correctly? You did. And so this kind of sampling is exactly as you point out, is this approach is very common, right? We do it when we you know, at, at airport security, people get sampled, right? We do it uh, in a financial audit, right? It's not like every single transaction uh, that a company does in a financial audit is reviewed. It's more that there's a sample process to, to, to get a sense of things. And if problems are detected, then they might start looking at more issue, more of those transactions, right, to figure things out. It's the same concept here, except the math is adapted to the question of elections. In particular, you can imagine that in an election, if the margin of victory is declared to be very high, like it's a crushing victory, then you don't need to look at that many ballots to, to, mm. to see that, right? It should be pretty obvious just by looking at a handful of ballots, right? But if the margin is tight, then you're going to have to look at a lot more ballots to detect that. And so there's election-specific formulas for figuring out what the sampling process is going to be, but the concept is the same. Right. So one more thing before we leave the vulnerabilities, and that is uh, I've been to the voting village at DEF CON. I, I've, I've interviewed Harry Hursty. We've seen, uh, or at least I've seen the uh, the documentaries that show him hacking a tabulation machine to change, to alter the outcome of the results. And I have at least seen situations where these, this voting equipment has open USB ports on it. They have Wi-Fi chips in them that supposedly weren't there that are there that could be easily enabled. There's, you know, all these hardware and uh, software hacks. We the, the software is closed. We can't review it. So we don't know that the bugs are there, but they've figured out that they're running like 10 year old versions of libraries that are known to have vulnerabilities. I mean, all these horrible sounding things to security researchers. So how bad is it? I mean, I know that we've seen these things. Are these, not yours, of course, but the other voting equipment <laughs> that, that you're trying to replace. Uh, how, how really bad are these in terms of just basic security flaws? So the most important thing that we should point out is the Voting Village is doing good work in raising awareness around this stuff. And at the same time, they generally don't have access to the latest voting equipment. Right. 
So they're showing you machines that are pretty old, some of which are still in use, some of which are not. And I would say that many of today's voting machines that are in the field generally do not have accessible USB ports, generally do not have Wi-Fi. Th those things are generally not an issue. Could they be more secure? Yes. Are there issues with outdated libraries and operating systems? Yes. I think they're somewhat mitigated by the fact that these machines are never online, and so it's harder to actually exploit those mm. vulnerabilities. But it's okay. It's still, there's still plenty of room to criticize and say, hey, they should be better. I mean, for example, every machine on the market today is certified to a version of the federal standard that is from 2005. That's older than the first iPhone. <laughs> right. That's that's old, yeah. right? And in particular, that version of the standard does not include what you would assume is in a security standard. Like there's no penetration testing that's required in that version of the standard, right? right. So at VotingWorks, we've been adamant about pushing for what is called VVSG 2.0, the version two of the federal standard, which has a lot more of these protections, requires penetration testing, requires secure boot, requires digitally signing any files that are transferred from one machine to the other. All of these things that you expect are like, yeah, that sounds like <laughs> the way that you want to design one of these systems, but it's not the way many of the systems out there are designed. So I don't think they're egregiously vulnerable, but I do think we could do more to protect the voting systems that are out there. But here's the real issue. Why doesn't the voting village have access to the latest equipment right. to try to hack it? And that's because this is an industry that's incredibly secretive and kind of behaves like late 90s, early 2000s at best IT, right? Which is like, let's do everything through secrecy. And I think that's got to be fought hard. I think it's really important to make voting equipment available for people to try to break and for feedback to be provided back to the manufacturers. Some of that is happening. We're starting to see a little bit more of a bug bounty approach to voting equipment, but it's it's baby steps and we should go a lot further than what's happening today. All right. So now I, I really want to get to the elephant in the room, which to me is trust. Uh, and yeah. And that is... In, in this country, certainly after the 2020 election, we've really had some issues around that to the point where I think, I think I read somewhere, 35% of all Americans and 65% of Republicans think that that election was fraudulent in some way. Mm -hmm. And yet Chris Krebs, who was the director of CISA uh, at the time of that election, said that it was the most secure election ever in American history and probably got fired for saying, probably got fired by Trump for saying right. that. Mm -hmm. When I at the DEFCON voting village just this year, there, uh, at the opening ceremony, Matt Blaze gave it a talk, and what the, one of the first slides he put up, I thought was really interesting, and it said, you know, "We have two unsatisfying realities," is the way he put it. He said, first is there are serious vulnerabilities in many parts of the U.S. Uh, US election infrastructure that, if exploited, could alter election outcomes in some U.S. jurisdictions, but two, also. There's no credible evidence that technical vulnerabilities have ever actually been exploited to alter the outcome of a U.S. election. First of all, what what is your take on that? Do you do you do you agree with those two statements that are not mutually satisfying? I mostly agree with them. I think one subtlety that may be missing from those statements is that sometimes as security folks, we think of the technical vulnerabilities like, look, there's this flaw in the software, and if you just do X, Y, and Z, then you can exploit it. But we forget about the procedural protections mm. that happen around the system. And so I'd say even if there are some software vulnerabilities, they are probably harder to exploit than just stating that they exist. Um, and I think Matt Blaze knows that. I, don't, I, I, I doubt that this is something he would disagree with. But, but it's still true that we could do better at securing existing voting equipment, and we could do better at providing more evidence that the equipment is secure. As you know, at VotingWorks, we are strong proponents of open source for mm -hmm. voting, voting systems. Not because we think open source is going to solve every problem. We don't. But also we think that some folks in this community have mistakenly adopted the reasoning that, well, if it's not going to solve every problem, then it's not important. <laughs> it's like, right. well, that's not how it works. Elections are all about evidence. Everybody who's in this field knows this. It's about evidence. You should provide as much evidence as you can that the voting system you're using is operating properly. And you should request of people who claim that it's not operating properly that they bring some evidence too, right? It's it's an evidence. It's all about evidence. Well, and, tra <laughs> right? and transparency, a, frankly, uh, you know, be, being transparent, well, transparent about what you're doing. 
Well, tra- well, that's what I mean. What I mean is that transparency is a form of evidence. Is it perfect evidence, right? If you have an open source voting machine and you're a technologist, you go, that's that's great, but like, how do I know for sure that that open source code is the code that was installed on that machine? And then sometimes the conclusion from that statement is, well, so who cares about open source? And that's the part where I strongly disagree. I'm like, yes, you are right. There is still a gap. Mm-hmm. When you have open source, an open source system, you still have to ask yourself, well, how do we make sure that the right open source system was installed on the machine? But that's a much more tractable problem than nobody knows what's on the machine right. or, except the testing lab and the, and the voting company, right? Like right. The, having more evidence out there, more transparency is going to help people rebuild trust. And I did want to cite one major victory we've had at Voting Works that seems to confirm that hypothesis. So it's a pretty recent news. As of six weeks ago, we are the first new vendor of voting systems certified in the state of New Hampshire in 30 plus years. Oh, wow. And one of the main reasons that we were able to achieve this, and that means that our voting system will be in use in New Hampshire in 2024, not everywhere, but in a number of places in New Hampshire in 2024. One of the main reasons is open source. The Secretary of State of New Hampshire has said in multiple press interviews that open source is a very interesting way to rebuild voter trust. And we've even seen it in actual surveys of the public. So New Hampshire did a survey of people who attended a very large uh, demonstration of voting equipment in August of this year. Hundreds of people attended. They surveyed the public and they surveyed legislators. And there were three vendors there, including Voting Works. And 65% of the public and legislators picked voting works mm. over the other two vendors, 65%. Nice. Over the incumbent who had less than 35% and the number one vendor of voting systems in the US who had 5%. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's not, I mean, I think our machine is pretty great. Our tab, this is a precinct scanner. I think it's great. I think we've built something wonderful and it's easy to use and all of that. Why did we win such a crushing victory? It's not like it's that much easier to use than the other systems. Again, I think it's quite great, but is it three times better, easier to use than the other systems? Is it 10 times easier to use? Maybe not that much. It's about transparency. It's because we had protesters outside that that uh, demo with posters that said, that said, you know, I want my ballots to be hand counted. And when we stopped and we talked to them, because I always like to talk to folks who care this much about elections. And they said, wait, are you the open source people? <laughs> we said, yeah, we're the open source people. We're voting works. And they said, well, look, if we have to use voting machines, then we should use the open source voting machine. And I don't want to get all like, you know, on a podium and appeal to people's patriotism or any, but, but like there was a very moving moment to realize that that was a very reasonable thing for them to say. It was a compromise. We don't hear a lot of compromises in mm. this field anymore. Mm. We hear a lot of people fighting and screaming at each other like somehow the other the other half of the country is is traitors, right? right? Instead of traitors. That's not but maybe maybe it's my hope. If we can have more transparency, if we can be fully cards on the table, this is how our software works. If you want to understand how we calculate how filled a bubble is and how we decide whether you can look at our source code, you can hire somebody to, to look at the source code if you don't want to do it yourself. If we have more ground truth, if we have more shared facts, maybe we can lower the temperature of this massive polarization that we have just a little, just a couple degrees, right? And then start having conversations and finding compromises that we're all okay with again. That's what I'm hoping for. Open source, a nonprofit voting vendor, we're not going to solve all the problems, but maybe we can lower the temp by a degree or two and help us have the conversations we need to be having. Again, I think trust is is huge here. And it's, you know, there's obviously the accuracy of the results of voting in a democracy are extremely important by definition. But if the people don't trust that that those results were accurate, even if they were, that is equally a problem. And yes, what I worry about is because of the, the, you know, turning the temperature down thing that you're talking about, we're actually at the point now, and I don't recall this being like this ever in human history or us history of 
election workers and poll workers being threatened and harassed by people because they are so upset because they are sure that there's tampering going on and they're sure that the, this you know the, the election is rigged i mean people are slipping in extra votes or uh, or changing tabulations or throwing away votes or whatever the case may be they don't trust the people involved in these things and i'm worried that uh, a couple things first of all i'm worried that i think a lot of the election officials that we had that kept things running as well as they did despite the outcries that they weren't uh, are leaving because they are being threatened and they're unfortunately being replaced with a lot of the people that were complaining about how fraudulent the elections were. So I'm kind of worried about the people taking their places. And second, I think poll workers used to be a volunteer thing. It's, I've done it before and I encourage, I've encouraged people to do it where I think a lot of people now have seen how those people have been treated. Some of them have death threats. So one of the things I'd like to ask your opinion on is, and this is something I actually, I was, I had the opportunity to ask Chris Krebs this uh, on a panel at, at DEF CON is can we, change the processes. I, I think transparency, obviously, the software and the hardware is definitely part of it, but also I think the process as well and risk building audits. Can we engineer the system to the point where I don't care if it's with untrustworthy people or untrustworthy equipment? I don't want to have to trust the equipment of the people. I want to trust the process. And the example I gave was like when I, I was in Vegas for this conference because that's where this conference is. And when I go to play blackjack and I lose, I don't blame the dealer. I don't blame the pit boss. I don't even blame the casino. I know that these guys have got cameras everywhere. There's gambling commissions that are looking at all the slot machines and regulating how all this stuff works. There are audits being performed. I trust the process to know that I don't have to trust the dealer or the casino. I just lost. <laughs> so can we get to the point? You know, I never even think about harassing my any of these people because I, I don't have to. Can we get to the same place with our elections where we don't have to trust the people and the machines? We trust the process. Well, you bring up an interesting analogy, right? Because in the gambling world, and by the way, there are voting companies that do voting machines and gambling equipment. It's actually, <laughs> there are quite a few parallels between the two, especially on the regulatory level. You say you don't have to trust anybody, but that's not true. You do have to trust that the, you know, the gambling oversight folks are the you know the, the Nevada Gambling Commission is actually doing its job that they're not being right. paid off by the the casino to actually take sure. more of your yeah, money sure. than so so you're but you're trusting that the system overall is is doing it's not like you have access to all the evidence you're trusting that enough people have access to the evidence that chances are things are going to go well and there's checks and the balances problem, in the system I guess is maybe the better way to put it that's right yeah so I would claim that we have already better than that in the voting space, right? We have testing labs that test voting equipment. We have federal standards. We have state standards. We have a lot of checks and balances in the process. You know, we have observers of polls who can report issues that come up. Like we, we have a lot of stuff going on, right? That, that uh, we have a lot of checks and balances to use the terminology you used. But if I take your question at face value all the way to the end, which is, can it be such that you have to trust no one like you can just figure, just by looking at the evidence, you can be convinced yourself. It turns out, yes, there are theoretical ways to do that with technologies uh, that fall under the umbrella of end-to-end -end verifiable voting, E2EVV is sometimes what that is called. The closest we have in practice to that is Election Guard, a toolkit that came out of Microsoft yes, yes. that is now being uh, run by the uh, Council on State Governments and the, their election technology initiative. And they've done some pilots most recently in Maryland that I think are promising and are really interesting in that respect. And they use fancy cryptography to basically give you a receipt of your ballot without letting you prove who you voted for, but then the fancy math lets you check that all those receipts when combined give you the result that was claimed. And it's really cool stuff. I don't know yet if it's going to scale and it's going to be something that voters can trust because the math is pretty complicated. And so you still have to at least say, well, let me phone my, my favorite cryptographer and ask them what they think of this, right? But I think it's great that we're piloting this. And I think it's great that we're looking into it. My personal opinion is that I'm not sure we need that level of trust no one uh, mm -hmm. in an election. Mm -hmm. But I think it's great that we're exploring it. And I would say that as long as we continue, I would say that if we look at what we do with voting machines today and we require more transparency of vendors, I don't see any reason why voting equipment shouldn't all be open source. Documentation, open source, training materials, open training videos, open 
right? Just make it all open. And then make the process of certification also more open. There's always going to be back and forth and negotiations between a testing lab and a manufacturer, depending on how do you interpret this requirement and how do you do this. Make it all open. Just make it public yeah. and make sure that anybody can look at that. And you'll get some spurious things like, oh, somebody will pick a line out of it and make a big deal out of it. And Okay. And once we get past that, we'll get to a world of like, yes, this is how real security works. It's never black and white. There's always there's always grays, right? There's always like, well, this is the trade-off. We did this for you ability and maybe it's like a smidgen less secure, but it's mitigated by this and this and this other measure. Why is this all secret? When it's secret, it breeds distrust. Right. And I think the bar is higher for voting than it is for gambling because you kind of already accept that the casinos are ripping you off, <laughs> you know, but you're never going to accept wins. the house always wins. That's not okay. When it's voting, the, the <laughs> right. state, the state, the state shouldn't always win. Like the people decide. Right. So, right, right, right. Um, so I think the bar is higher. The bar should be higher. Uh, does it need to be to the point that you really don't need to trust anyone? I don't know, but I'm glad we're doing pilots to figure that out. Right. And yeah, I've looked at that election card thing. It's really cool. If I, as, I, as I recall, you can you get this receipt, you can take home, and I think you can verify in particular that your vote was counted and it was counted the way you voted without being able to prove how you voted. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a subtlety about the part about knowing that it is a receipt for what you actually meant to vote for because – you know, that's the part where if it's not done per correctly, you could prove right. it to somebody else. But conceptually, yes, you are correct. You get both those proofs, and that's that's pretty cool stuff. I mean, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of all the cryptography behind it. It was the topic of my PhD work also, and so so I love it. I just – like I said, I, I don't yet know if it's a model that will scale. So at Voting Works, we're mostly focused on the other approach, which is maximum transparency. You see everything that's that's happening – you don't get this encrypted receipt for your vote, but you know you get a lot of confidence through transparency, simplicity of the equipment, and a number of modern security defenses in layers to make sure that, yes, even though we do audit elections such that you don't strictly have to trust the tabulators, wouldn't it be nice if it was actually hard to hack the tabulator? Right. And that's that's another thing that we do. All right. So we've talked about making sure that my vote gets counted. But I, I, what came out of the 2020 election, I think, and what a lot of people really get hung up on is this other people voting who shouldn't have voted or voting twice or voting three times. And so I kind of I kind of want to address that, get your take on that. First of all, how, how common is that? Because every everything I've ever heard that did any research on this says it's almost negligible, like it almost never happens. But I, more to the point, what I'd like to, to, to have your opinion on is how good of a way is that to throw an election? Because in-person voter fraud, even if you can pull it off, is really hard to do at scale. It's hard. I mean, let's say I got a thousand people in a tight race to I paid them off to vote or I paid them to vote twice or whatever. The chance of a thousand people keeping a secret is nil. <laughs> right. You know, right. what was it? Franklin or whatever. Somebody said you know, three people could keep a secret as long as two of them were dead. Right. <laughs> so. It, it, so I want to address this notion of in-person voter fraud. How common is it really? How hard is it to pull off? I mean, it, even if you do do it, the, it's easy to catch. And, it, and you, the, there's a jail sentence, I think. It's horrible. Talk to me about in-person voter fraud and why we should not worry about that, I hope. All the evidence we have is that voter fraud, by that we mean voters impersonating others, casting ballots on behalf of people they shouldn't stuffing ballot boxes, which is just adding more ballots to be counted than should be counted. All the evidence shows that there's negligible impact of that. Every every election, a couple people get caught for double voting. Oftentimes it's a mistake. They forgot they should, they mailed a ballot and et cetera, right? right? Uh, sometimes it's not. Sometimes people are voting in two states because they're registered in two states and they don't think they're going to get away with it, right? But again, this is minimal and the the penalty is large like you're you're going to be in serious pain if you get caught doing that so i i just don't spend a lot of time worrying about it because i just don't think it has any significant impact if you really want to reach here i think there are some historical examples of this kind of fraud having an impact in small local elections right where you can swing the outcome with a, a handful of votes just by putting pressure on a few people and whatnot and we shouldn't ignore that. I think those those things should be prosecuted. But I think if you're worried about voter fraud affecting a national election, there's absolutely no evidence that there's anything close to that. 
Um, so you also mentioned that there's there are new standards in place. I think it was, you, you mentioned you rattled off VV something or other. I think one of those yes. V's is voluntary, right? <laughs> yes, voluntary so, voting systems guidelines. So voluntary trips me up. <laughs> but mm-hmm. so what has it got? Have things gotten better in, in recent years? Because we don't, as you said, we've got this massively heterogeneous system where everybody can kind of choose how they want to do it. And I, it seems to me like we, we needed federal guidelines. We need like federal minimum standards for security and processes. Are you saying that we actually do have some of those now? Are those coming into play that where they weren't there before? Mm-hmm. Well, we have them uh, since after Florida 2000. Well, there were standards before that, but they started to be more enforced and better put together after Florida 2000, which led to the Help America Vote Act, which led to the creation of the Election Assistance Commission, which led to the creation of the Voluntary Voting Systems Guidelines, version 1.0, that came out in 2005. The voluntary voting systems guidelines are called voluntary because the states don't have to follow them. States in general don't like to be told by the federal government what they have to do. So calling it voluntary is both true and maybe a little bit of a hack of like, yeah, it's voluntary. Just, you know, join us if you'd like to, right? The fact of the matter is that most states do follow the voluntary voting systems guidelines. There's a handful that don't. Uh, But even among the ones that don't, you know, California, for example, is one that does not follow the federal voluntary voting systems guidelines because they have their own. Mm. (laughs) They have their own testing regime. That sounds like California. uh, And it looks a lot like the federal voluntary Mm. voting systems guidelines. It's heavily inspired by that. But California is big enough that they can define their own process and and whatnot. So, you know, it's pretty – similar to have a voting system tested for California and for the rest of the country. There's a handful of states that do their own state process that's, uh, you know, a little bit different than the federal process. But for the most part, if you want to have voting machines sold across the U.S., you have to abide by the voluntary voting systems guidelines. I think they're getting better. I think 1.0 was an immensely beneficial step after what Mm. came before it, which was not much, Right. right? And the latest version, VVSG2, which was finalized in 2021, is a huge improvement on VVSG1. Now, I still have plenty of complaints about it, plenty of things that I think are not necessarily the right trade-off that could be too prescriptive or that can be not prescriptive enough. Uh, But it's a huge improvement. It has a lot more to the security portions of the standard. It is more modern in terms of how it looks at modern technical approaches. There's a bunch of things in... VVSG1 that if you looked at it, you're like, I don't even understand it. I feel like this is a, applies if I'm programming in COBOL and not <laughs> if I'm programming in any other language. Yeah. Uh, so they, they've, they've mostly cleaned that up. I think a lot of great work went into that. Again, plenty of criticism I could direct at it and say, you know, this could be better, but I think we're trending better overall. Are there laws in place or coming up maybe that will force some of these vendors to open their proprietary systems to third party independent audits. For example, for many years it was it was illegal under the DMCA and some other these kind of horribly written laws that for voting village hackers were, could actually be thrown in jail for trying to circumvent some of these some of these processes to to get into the code and reverse engineer some of this code and, and some of these devices. <laughs> Can we make it a, a law that these companies have got to submit these things for third-party independent audits and so they don't have to buy them off eBay and get older systems and things like that. Yeah. This is probably one of my bigger criticisms of this the voting space is that there is too much deference to vendors who want to keep things private mm-hmm. and say, well, they're a private company. They get to do what they want. You know, The certification process does require revealing source code to the testing authorities, to the, to the testing labs, rather. But those are there are only two testing labs in the U.S. Uh, that are accredited for vo- testing voting systems. So that's not really the kind of public audit that you're talking about. Mm. I do think that this world should be much more aggressive about forcing public audits, about revealing yeah. how these things work. I think there's really – there's just not a good argument for keeping this stuff secret. Like right. what what are we hiding here? Like – you know, advanced alien technology that's counting the votes. Like, come on, like th- this is silly. You know, we, we sh- this should be open for the world to see. I fully, I fully endorse that. All right. So before we go, a couple of things it, uh, for folks that might want to either learn more or get more involved. How, like if I'm curious, how do I find out what kind of voting systems uh, I have at, at, at my local elections, how much they've been open to audits maybe. Mm-hmm. And then if I want to, if I find something I don't like, if I, think that our our county's backwards or whatever and needs to be using paper ballots and risk limiting audits how do i as a citizen advocate for for these things what is the kind of the best way to 
to do that. And and let's say I want, hey, you know what? You guys should be using Voting Works. <laughs> how do I how do yeah. I voice that? So great set of questions. First, if you want to find out what equipment is being used in your town or county or state, the best resource is by Verified Voting, the nonprofit that's been advocating for paper ballots and good election, you know, judicious use of technology in elections. Love them. They're mm-hmm. a great, great organization. They've done a lot of good for voting in the U.S., uh, verifiedvoting.org. They have a tool that catalogs exactly what voting equipment is used in the, the various jurisdictions and tracks it over time. It's mm. amazing. It's fantastic. So you should check that out. If you want to advocate for change, mostly that stuff happens at the state level, especially if you want audits, right? So you should talk to your state rep if your state does not conduct rigorous post-election audits. That is not terribly hard to do if it's in the law. And so the way to do it is you really want that to be a state law that says we run post-election audits. The best model for that is Georgia. Georgia's laws, I think, are among the best. I'm sure there's ways to make them better still, but if you want a good starting point, the way Georgia mandates risk-limiting audits is great. And I think most states should do that. So if you want to advocate for that with your state rep, that's a great thing to do. If you want to advocate for open source voting equipment, I think it's also a conversation to have with state reps. I think following New Hampshire's example that really values open source, they're not mandating it, but they're valuing it, I think is an important uh, important next step for a number of states. And we're hearing from a couple of states that this is interesting to them. They, they see signs that it could reduce distrust, right? And 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 rebuild some of that voter trust we, we so badly need. Usually your local folks in your town or in your county, they're not usually the right people to lobby about voting equipment or auditing processes because usually they're following the options that are provided to them by the state. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can go be a poll worker. You can go help out. You can learn how it works in your town or county because there's a saying in the election space, which is you've seen elections in one state, you've seen elections in one state. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, processes, they're different across the country. And it's just worth really seeing how it goes. But, you know, I want to connect to another question you asked earlier. Because even though there's all these differences across the country, there's also a lot of similarity between election officials, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, whether they're in the South or the West or the North. You see this incredible dedication to democracy folks who care, folks who really want the process to be followed so that everyone gets a vote, so that elections are free and fair. And I want to connect it to the point you made about how a number of people are leaving the -hmm. field and other people are joining the field who maybe have, even if it's not malicious intent, who are convinced that it's all fraudulent and they're going to do better. And I say, bring it on. Come on in, run an election, because I think when you when you do the work to do that, when you learn all the things you need to learn to run a proper election, you start to be connected to all the other clerks mm. across the country, mm-hmm. and you start to understand the work. And I think the outcome of that is more likely to be greater respect for election administration, more so than corruption, of election administration. I'm hopeful in that respect. I'm sure some of those people have malicious intent and those people might disrupt things in some places. But if you're actually charged with running an election, you're going to, and you're even a half decent human being, which I think most people are, you're going to realize why we do the things we do, why we have ballot drop boxes, why we have signature verification the way we do it, why we don't uh, have special fibers in ballot paper to verify that it's, you know, like that's that's not how it's done. And there's very good reasons why it's done that way. Nothing better than doing the job to realize that. So on that, I I certainly think that the way election administrators have been treated is absolutely unacceptable. Oh, yeah. We cannot allow that. And the harassment has to be punished, right? There have yep. to be examples set. Like you cannot harass your election administrators. You cannot You cannot attack them. It's just unbelievable. But I'm optimistic that if folks want to jump in and help running elections, 
it'll build more empathy for what it's like to do that. Well, that is a fantastic way to wrap this up. Thanks a lot, Ben. That's, that was really important information. And I'm so glad you guys are doing what you're doing. And I hope that these sorts of uh, election systems, open systems are adopted everywhere. Um, and we get to get get to implementing all these things that we know that we need to be doing. Thanks again for coming back on the show, Ben. Thanks for having me, Kerry. It's great to be here. Thank you for uh, for the time. That was such a great interview, and it's such an important topic. I mean, it's hard to find something more more important in a democracy than how we run our elections. And we in the United States, for for whatever reason, have really got some problems with believing our elections. And transparency is going to be absolutely crucial. That's why we've got to have a voter verifiable paper paper trail. Uh, you know, as we submit our votes, that which we talked about in the in the interview today. And risk limiting audits. We should have these everywhere. He mentioned that 11 states have these. I looked this up. Uh, I believe the states are Washington, California, Nevada, Texas, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. But I think other states are also considering this. So if this is something that's happening in your state, you should absolutely be letting your voice be heard and telling your representatives that you absolutely think we should be doing RLAs or risk limiting audits. I put a lot of links in the in the show notes today that you might be interested in. Obviously, links to Voting Works. Also, their article about risk limiting audits with their Arlo tool. I linked to the Verified Voting Verifier tool, which uh, Ben mentioned. Uh, if you want to find out what voting equipment is used in your state and what counties in your state, it gets very granular. I tried to find Ben's PhD thesis, a PDF of that. I couldn't find it, but I did find his. Uh, his thesis defense, if you want to look at his presentation, he's got many, many presentations actually listed there. That's one of many. So if you're really want to dig into this and get into some of the heavy duty stuff, uh, there's a link to that in the show notes. I also linked to the uh, VVSG 2.0 or the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. I've not read it myself, but I plan to skim that sometime soon. And then if you're interested in, in more of this kind of stuff, I interviewed Hari Hursty a while back who runs the voting village, the uh, voting hacking village, basically at DEF CON. And he was f famous for the Hursty hack, for being able to hack a voting tabulation system to change the outcome of the election without any trace of evidence. And this is, again, this is this weird dichotomy we have where some of these equipment is vulnerable. And this hack was done many, many years ago, by the way, uh, to Ben's point that a lot of our systems have been updated. But I talked to Hari about this and his kind of thing is finding these vulnerabilities and f trying to find ways to hack these things so that we can improve them. And I also interviewed Ethan Chumley from uh, Microsoft about their election guard system. And I didn't put links to the show notes of this because it was getting kind of, <laughs> the show notes were getting kind of long. But if you look back through my podcast and you search for verified voting, another great organization, at one point uh, I interviewed two different presidents, uh, Barbara Simons and Marion Schneider. So lots of great stuff. And as you can tell, this is something that is very interesting to me. And I've been wanting to talk to Ben for a really long time, and I'm glad we finally got him on the show. Now, for the patrons, we've got some bonus content. I asked Ben what he thinks about ranked choice voting. Uh, if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's very interesting. It's particularly interesting if you if you like the idea of third parties. And I also asked him a few more details about how their uh, voting works election systems actually work, what they look like, a little more details about how they function. So as usual, my patrons will be getting that Thursday morning. Okay, so next week, we've got our best of 2023 episode. These are all the regular episodes. I went back and picked some of my favorite clips uh, from this year. The week after that, we're going to be doing a classic throwback. I'm going to go back to 2017, the first year I did this podcast. And I've got a couple interesting clips from there that you may not have heard, or, or at least have not heard for a long time. And finally, after that, I'm going to do a best of the bonus episodes for 2023. These are the episodes that only my patrons so far have heard. This is from the bonus content that I give to my patrons. So I wanted to give you guys a little taste of what that was like. There's been some great content there, too. So a lot of great stuff coming up here, coming up to the holidays. If you have not already, subscribe, and then you won't miss any of that. All right, everybody, that'll do it for this week. Take care. Be sure to check out my best and worst gift guide for 2023. There's a link to that in the show notes as well. And if you want to give the gift of privacy or security, check out my coupons at fdsd.me slash coupons. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>